human beings are hardwired to fear. Since our early ancestors roamed the plains of Africa, exploring their environment, we have feared things that are dangerous. We've scanned our environment for threats, and because we have, we have survived to explore another day. So fear is a good thing. As we're walking along a path and we see some thin, long object in the grass, we might recoil a little bit, and in the process, we avoid getting bitten by a snake. And so we have protected ourselves. But sometimes, that very fear that protects us can also interfere with our goals. So as we're walking through the wooded area, if our goal is to collect enough wood to build a fire, we may see a long, thin object and bypass it no, and, and have given up the stick, the, the very thing that we were trying to find. So sometimes, fear can get out of hand. It can block us from getting what we really want, what we really need. Now, we have continued to explore as a human species. As we moved out of Africa, we have encompassed the entire globe. We have explored the depths of the oceans. We have sent spacecraft into the solar system to try to understand our place in the universe. And all the while along, we bring with us this very natural, very realistic, very understandable fear of the unknown including creatures that may or not be out there, but that could be of danger to us. In 1960, a group of astronomers started a new way of exploring the universe called SETI, the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence. Using radio telescopes, they look for signals from other civilizations, a, a telltale sign that there is intelligence out there trying to make contact. Unfortunately, so far they haven't found anything. But what happens if every civilization is doing exactly what we are, just listening with our own SETI programs and not sending anything out? It could be a very, very quiet universe. Today, I'll explain why we should be flipping SETI around and trying to make contact in a different way. Not just searching for signals coming in, but sending out powerful, intentional signals to other stars in the hope of getting a response. And that we can do that, but only if we are willing to face our fears, to look at the risks we might face, and at the end, even if we do not detect any life out there, we will profoundly transform our view of ourselves. Now, if we do make contact, either through SETI or through what's called METI, messaging extraterrestrial intelligence, sending signals out, if we do make contact, there's one thing we can know about that civilization. They'll be much longer lived than we are. Why do I say that? Well, we have had the technology to communicate across interstellar distances for just 100 years. That's how long we have had radio. Well, if that's the norm in our galaxy, if a civilization has the technology to communicate, and then after a century, maybe it annihilates itself in a nuclear war, or destroys its environment through global warming, or maybe just becomes contemplative and spends all its time doing yoga. You know, there are a lot of ways that you could curtail the lifetime of the civilization in terms of exploring, but if that's what happens, if they last as long as we have, if they are our equals in longevity, then we'll never make contact. Because what are the chances that in the 13 billion year history of our galaxy, their hundred years and our hundred years coincide? Zero. I mean, it's as likely as in the course of a long, dark night, you have two fireflies that each flick on for just a moment. What's the chance it's going to happen at exactly the same point? It won't. So what that means is if we do make contact, 
either by listening for signals or sending ours out, we know that they will be a much longer-lived civilization. And so there could be real benefits of encountering a civilization like that, a civilization that has made it through some of the challenges that we face in our own adolescent stage of development. And even if they don't tell us the solutions to solving our world's problems, simply the knowledge that there is another civilization out there that has made it could give us reassurance that we can as well. Now, we think about the benefits of making contact with another civilization, but of course the flip side is, are there any risks? And so I'd like you to think for a moment, imagine a scenario in which humankind and an advanced alien civilization make first contact. What's it like? Now for many people, your view is going to be guided by the most vivid images that come to mind. It's something that cognitive psychologists called the availability heuristic. When you're trying to assess the risk of some unknown situation, you use the most vivid, most available images that come to mind. And if you've seen any sci-fi movies lately, it's probably not a very optimistic first encounter. That it, especially if it's a blockbuster that you've really seen, you know, it's not gonna start, we come in peace. Um, and so if that's the impression you have of what a first contact is going to be, you might have some reservations and say, I'm not so sure that we should be sending our greetings out into space. But there's only one problem. It's too late for us to hide. Because any civilization that has the ability to travel to Earth to annihilate us can already pick up the accidental TV and radio signals we've been leaking off into space for 100 years. So they know we're here, and sending an intentional message is not going to increase our visibility. It's going to let them know we want to make contact, but it's not going to let them know for the first time that we're here. Well, so you might say to yourself, well, if in fact they already know that we're here, what's the whole point? Why send another message? Well, when we message extraterrestrials, we're trying to solve one of the greatest puzzles of this last century. It was posed by an Italian physicist named Enrico Fermi in 1950. And he said, if there are aliens out there, why haven't we made contact? So it's called the Fermi paradox. And so one possible answer to the Fermi paradox is that the aliens really are out there, maybe even around the nearest stars. But they're just not letting us know. And this is sometimes called the zoo hypothesis, that they're watching us like we watch animals in a zoo. So they know we're here, they're just not going to communicate with us. So how could we use that scenario to try to make contact? Imagine for a moment that we go to the zoo, looking at all the animals, looking at a bunch of zebras, just getting ready to move on to the hyenas. But then out of the corner of our eye, we see that one of those zebras has stepped forward. It's looking us directly in the eye. It picks up its hoof and starts pounding out, pound, 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 pound. Now, I don't know about you, um, but I am not going to go check out the hyenas at this point. I'm going to stick around with the zebra and see whether it knows some basic arithmetic or anything. And so the, the point is, if we would have another species attempt to make contact, it would draw our attention and we would feel compelled to reply. And so that's what we hope to do with the aliens. So as we send out our messages, what might their response be like if it's anything like mine to the zebra? So imagine there's an alien astronomer, maybe she's working the graveyard shift, monitoring Earth. Oh, here comes another I Love Lucy episode. I've seen this one before. But wait, wait, this is something different. This seems to be an intentional message. 
I think this is an application to join the Galactic Club. But wait, they're even willing to pay their dues. And that's something we've never been willing to do before. Because if you talk with SETI scientists, they'll say, well, you know, the other civilizations are much more advanced. Let them do the heavy lifting. We'll just listen and they can send. Well, that works great if they're actually doing it. So far, it hasn't worked. But maybe the alien is thinking, show us you've got a little skin in the game yourself. You know, here you are coming to us. We've been through this process hundreds of times. You've got a lot more to gain. Why don't you start by showing us something? So maybe, in fact, the galactic protocol is that it's the audacious young civilizations that need to take the initiative to make contact. So that's what we're trying with METI, messaging extraterrestrial intelligence. So that's something we can do. We have the technology. We have the transmitters. But the big question is, do we have the patience and do we have the willingness to face our fears? And it's not just fears about alien annihilation. I mean, we can analyze those fears and say, you know, that's not really something to be too concerned about. After all, not only have we been leaking radio signals out for a century, but for two billion years, our Earth's atmosphere has given evidence that there's abundant life on our planet. So any especially ali uh, paranoid aliens who want to wipe out all the competition, they've had plenty of time to come here, and they haven't. So I'm not too worried about that scenario. But there are other kinds of fear, other kinds of risks that we have to face head on if we're to have any chance at making contact. And sometimes those aren't the big existential threats, like are the aliens going to wipe us out, but they're much more personal. And sometimes it's the personal stuff that's more difficult to acknowledge. I remember when I was just starting my career 25 years ago as a psychologist, just finished my doctorate. And so I had to decide, what am I going to do now? And so as I looked around at what my fellow graduates were doing and what my mentors had done and what everyone expected, you know, the logical thing was to go on and be a professor and teach psychology or become a therapist and do something concrete to help people. What I was really interested, though, in is talking to aliens. But what would people think? I mean, would they be disappointed? I mean, these professors have invested years in training me. And ultimately, I came to the realization that what matters more is not what people think about me right now, but what would I think of myself as I look back from the future about the choice that I made. And so those are the things that we don't like to admit, that we're concerned what other people will think about us. But those are exactly the sort of things that we need to come to grips with if we're to really encounter our most basic fears. Now, one of the preconceptions of people who look for life beyond Earth is somehow we know in our bones that there's life out there. We just have to search long enough. I wish it were that easy. Because as we search for life beyond Earth, I think the greatest risk we have to face is that we're going to fail. No matter how hard we try, we may, at the end of the day, find out we're alone in the universe. Are we willing to take that risk? What would that even look like? Well, suppose we do exactly what I've been advocating, that we should be transmitting powerful, intentional signals to the stars and wait for a response. We start out with a hundred stars, but because none of those might have inhabitants, we extend it out to a thousand stars, and that takes a couple of decades. And then we extend it to a million stars, and that takes longer. But then, then we start the difficult part. We wait for a reply. We wait for decades, centuries, millennia. And all we get is this incessant cosmic silence. What then? 
will at first it will be dejected, defeated. It was all for naught. But then I think we'll get this, I don't know, a subtle sense, hard put into words, that something has changed. And then, all of a sudden, it'll fall into place. Because we'll realize that because we were willing to take on this audacious project to transmit messages to the stars, a project that cannot be completed by a single generation, and that then future generations picked up that project, and they continued even to the point of waiting for a reply, that because of the very actions that we have taken, we have become that long-lived civilization we've been searching for all along. And that is a risk I'm willing to take. Thank you.